for him. Amen? All right. If you would please do remain standing. Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be reading a single verse today, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Let's pray, and then we'll read. Our gracious Heavenly Father, may you be honored as we consider now your majesty, your beauty, your goodness, and your worthiness. In Jesus' name I pray this, amen. And so in verse 31, our Lord declares, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. May he preserve his people from error in receiving it. You may be seated. Now, I have not taken the time to go back and count how many weeks we've been here in Matthew chapter 25, though I do appreciate your indulgence. Next week, Lord willing, we will continue on with the rest of Matthew's gospel. For, but for today, there is one more absolutely essential truth we need to consider from our Lord's uh, teaching concerning the day of judgment. Because we've talked about what it means on that day for God's own people to enter into their inheritance, to uh, enter into the very kingdom of God that he's prepared for us from before the foundations of the world. We've talked about how on that day uh, we will recognize that the reality of hell that God's judgment is real, that his judgment is eternal. And blessedly, we have talked about how a person goes from deserving that eternal judgment to inheriting the eternal life within the kingdom of God. And we understand that that happens by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen? And today, as we come back to this single verse, I actually want to take that statement that we just said, and if you've been in this church for any significant length of time, you're familiar that, with the idea that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. I want to take that statement and actually extend it. I want to add a phrase to it today, because it is right and proper for us to say that we are saved by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Because ultimately, all things are done for and to the glory of God. The greatest good that can be is that God be glorified. In the scriptures, we are told to do all that we do to the glory of God. We are also told in both the Old and New Testaments that God created his own people for glory and that they would know the riches of his glory. And the end goal of human earthly history itself is that the earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, even as the waters cover the sea. Therefore, we can't help but conclude that we are saved by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And we see this truth on display in this single verse that opens our Lord's teachings on the day of judgment, because he tells us that the Son of Man Jesus Christ himself shall come in his glory and then he will sit on his glorious throne. And this is crucial for us to understand because brothers and sisters, the actual climax of history and the climax of that final day when Christ returns as joyful as it is, it's not actually that you and I enter into our inheritance. The climax, the greatest thing, is not actually that you and I experience the fullness of our salvation. Now, that is wonderful and, and something to certainly be looked forward to, but in truth, the actual climax of everything 
is that Jesus Christ himself will finally and fully enter into his inheritance as the king of glory in that glorious kingdom. And our entire purpose today is, I pray, to understand what that means. To consider the glory of God. And to understand it to whatever extent we're able to. And then in understanding that glory, we would better be able, we would be able to better ascribe to Him, declare His glory better now, and then anticipate His return in glory with greater confidence and joy and peace than we ever have before. So, to that end, two questions to answer. Two questions. First off, what is the glory of God? What is, what is glory in the first place? Because, again, if you've been in a church for any length of time, you, you pick up things. You know, that, that saying, grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone. You, you, you pick that up. And you pick up other things. You pick up words like redemption and atonement and forgiveness and repentance and, and belief. And we're pretty good with context clues. And we all have a, an intuition at work within us. And so we, we hear these words and we hear the context in which we're said, they're said. And we can get a, a, a decent understanding of what they're all about. But sometimes that understanding, even if it's accurate, it's still kind of surface level. And it's not until you take a moment or a lifetime to study God's Word and to drill down deep to see what these things truly mean. That's when you build a firm foundation on spiritual bedrock that you will not be moved off of. We have not only a surface understanding of these things, but a deep and abiding understanding, uh, a foundation of what words like this mean. And so today, I want to give us as much as possible that deep foundation of what it actually means for God to be glorious. So that's our first question. What is the glory of God? And then secondly, simply coming out of that, what does it then mean for his return? What does it mean then for Christ to return in his glory? So let's jump right in with that first question. What is glory? Let's just talk generally right now. We'll set aside God's glory, which is not easy to set aside, but topically we'll set that aside for the moment. And just, what is glory in general? Well, we are kind of helped by our intuition, by context clues, because uh, unlike other uh, biblical concepts and theological terms that you never hear in everyday conversation. The word glory is something that you do hear from time to time in just our everyday lives. You know, someone might think of a glorious victory when their favorite sports team wins the championship, right? Uh, not too many years ago, I was, I still very much enjoy football, but I was an avid uh, fan of professional football and, of course, the Patriots. And so, you know, one of the many times that they won the Super Bowl each time, it was glorious. The players and fans and whoever stream onto the field, there's the ticker tape stuff coming down, the trophy is held up high, and you just experience the glory of victory. Or to give a much different example, imagine sitting in a sanctuary like this, the back doors open, the music swells, the congregation stands, and the bride proceeds down the aisle, beautiful and radiant, present in all her glory. And so we have a general idea, uh, an intuitive understanding of what glory is all about. You think about the victory, you think about the bride, and you realize that there's something spectacular. If something is glorious, there's something spectacular about it. There's something that resounds with us. There, there's something deeply meaningful and beautiful about it. Because the victory and the bride are both beautiful in different ways, 
but it's there. And that kind of beauty affects us in our inner person in a profound way. And I would like to offer you a couple of words today from the Bible to help us get our minds around a more precise understanding that encapsulates the, 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 the spectacle and the, the splendor and the beauty. The first word is the biblical word majesty. That God is glorious because he is majestic. In Psalm 8.1 we read, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. You may have learned in the past that Hebrew poetry, which, which the Psalms are here, Hebrew poetry is not about rhyme like ours is, not about rhythm in the same way that ours is, but it's about parallel thoughts of one line, one lyric followed by another, and they build on each other. They help explain each other. So here we see that the majesty of God's name is directly associated with his glory. The reason why he's glorious is because he is majestic. And that word majestic contains all of the ideas of his beauty and his dignity and, and all that he is, really. For instance, in Psalm 29, which is not the same psalm as what we read for our call to worship, but it's going to sound very familiar. Psalm 29, part of it reads, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Again, to ascribe, to declare, to credit God with the glory that he deserves. And we'll get to the deserves part in a moment here. But the idea here that we're being instructed to declare the glory of God, and that glory is directly associated in the next line with the splendor of his holiness. Because again, majesty has to do with beauty and splendor, but also his holiness, which is one of his attributes, part, uh, a massive part of who God is. You know, to demonstrate that, we go back to Isaiah chapter 6, where the prophet Isaiah uh, is given this vision of the temple, of a temple, and God's presence in the temple. And, and God is depicted as being a king, a king so majestic, so high and lifted up, that we're told the train of his robe fills the temple. Now, what does that mean? What's the significance of that? Well, back in the olden days, Kings would wear royal robes, of course. And the robe, kind of like a, we talked about the bride earlier, the bridal gown that has a train behind it. Okay, the longer the train of the bridal uh, 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 gown, the more important she is, the more beautiful everything is considered to be. Same way for the king. The longer his train, the more majestic he is, the more honorable he is. And in this case, Isaiah is said to see that the entire temple is simply full of his train, the train of his robe. It, just, it fills everything. Not to be silly about it, but if you think about the movie Tangled, Rapunzel with the long hair that just goes everywhere. His, the train of his robe just fills the whole temple, which would, of course, indicate that if that's how long his train is, how great is God himself? How majestic and mighty and exalted. And of course, the seraphim in that text are calling out to each other saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The superlative degree, the holiest. The whole earth is full of His glory. And again, why? Why is there glory? Why is the whole earth full of His glory? Because of who God is in his holiness. And so God is glorious because he is majestic in all that he is. Not only his holiness, but his righteousness, his eternal power, because of his purity, the purity of all of his perfections, his perfections being his love, his grace, his justice, his kindness, his, his compassion, his wrath, his mercy and love. All that God is, 
is majestic, is beautiful. And therefore, it can be summarized by another word, a biblical word, even though we use it very frequently, the word good. God is good, which might seem somewhat anticlimactic, because we do use this word all the time. And I'm not trying to bring down a legalistic thing where you're not allowed to use the word good ever again because it's so special. But it is special, this word good, because when it comes right down to it, none of us are good. None is righteous. No, not one, the scriptures say. No one does good, not even one. You might be familiar with the episode from our Lord's earthly ministry when a rich young man approaches Jesus with flattery to get Jesus to answer his questions and possibly to vindicate him and and to justify him in his life as it stands at that moment. And as part of his flattery, he approaches Jesus and he says, good teacher, he calls Jesus good teacher, and then asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But of course, that address, that way of addressing Jesus, prompts Jesus to respond by asking him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And some people say, well, there you go. Jesus is admitting that he's not good. No, that's not what he's doing. He's recognizing that this rich young man is using the word good as simple flattery. He's just throwing it out there as a tool to be used but he doesn't actually know who Christ is. And so Jesus is saying, you got to be careful who you call good. Only God is good. So when you call me good, is it because you recognize who I am? Or are you just flattering? No one is good except God alone. Which is another reason why we must consider him beautiful and majestic. It's why he is glorious, because of who he is, and he is good. And this brings us to another aspect of God's glory that we must not miss. From our human illustrations of the victory and the bride, we get that kind of general intuitive sense of what glory is. It has to do with the beauty and the majesty and the splendor. It has to do with things that leave you awestruck. And that's correct. That, that, that is a huge part of what God's glory is. He leaves us awestruck in who he is. But also, out of that comes the reality of God's worthiness. His worthiness. As we go back to that Psalm 29 passage, and again we read, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The reason we're told to ascribe glory to his name is because he's due that glory. He is worthy of that glory. He is worthy of having people praise him and to acknowledge who he is in all that he is. And so he instructs his people. And yes, he demands to receive the glory that is due his name. Now let me talk about that for a minute because that may not go over too well in our modern world, our modern context, the idea that someone would demand praise, that someone would demand to be glorified. And people say, well, wait a minute, that's what a dictator does. That's what a tyrant does. And we have examples of that in the world today. You know, the idea, not to be too whatever, but that in North Korea, a certain picture has to be in every single room of every single home, venerating their glorious leader. Is that what God's like? Is he a tyrant that makes such a demand? Well, there's a massive difference between someone demanding glory that they do not deserve. That's where a person becomes a tyrant. But if the Lord God of the universe, the creator, instructs his creation to praise him, he is worthy of that. He deserves it. That praise belongs to him. And so it is right 
to both expect it on his part and to give it on our part. He is worthy. And again, brothers and sisters, this is why, as we've talked in past weeks, this is why the unbelieving world attacks and accuses God concerning who he is. They make the accusations to convince themselves and as many others as possible that God is not good. That there is some objectionable aspect of his character. And therefore he is not worthy of our worship, our adoration, our faithfulness, our obedience, our joyful submission. But as we've already shown, there are none of those accusations that can stand. They are all foolish because he is good. He is worthy in all that he is and all that he does. He created us. Psalm 95, oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He sustains us. Nehemiah 9, you are the Lord, you alone. You've made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it. And you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. He redeems his people to himself. 1 Corinthians 6, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. He acts in perfect justice. Psalm 145, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. This means that he always does what is right, which is the essence of, right, of, of justice and righteousness. And he never does anything out of spite or malice. In Psalm 147, he is abundant and in power, and his understanding is beyond measure. Which means not only is God all-powerful, but he has perfect wisdom and knowledge to know exactly how to use that power. What needs to happen in any given moment to produce the greatest good for his glory and for the benefit of his own people. And obviously I could go on with dozens more scriptures indicating who God is or what he has done leading us to worship him. But I pray that this so far is enough to demonstrate that he is worthy. For he is the creator. And despite the fact that we sinned and rebelled against him, he made a way for us to be reconciled back to him, that whoever believes in his Son should not perish, but have eternal life. This is the glory of God, the beauty and majesty and goodness of God. He is worthy of our worship, of our adoration, of all we have to give. Amen? And so... We could go deeper, <laughs> but with having that foundation laid, we now come to what it means for our Lord Jesus to return in glory. For he says to us, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, then he will sit on his glorious throne. As I mentioned a moment ago, the true climax of that final day is not going to be us coming into our inheritance as wonderful as that will be, but the true climax is Christ coming into his inheritance. The whole idea that Christ will return to sit on his glorious throne in the midst of his people. And as we discussed some weeks ago, that means that he will enter into the fullness of his rule and his reign on the earth. And I just want to recap very briefly the distinction between now and then. Because we say, well, isn't he ruling now? And of course, absolutely, he is ruling and reigning now. He does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. Right now, he is in charge. He does all that he wants to do. But for the purposes of his grace and his mercy, he will not put an end to things. He will not come for that final day of judgment until all of his people are saved. Till every last lost sheep 
is found. And so in the meantime, he puts up with the fact that people oppose his rule. That's what we mean when we say that God will come in the, fi- in the fullness of his kingdom. Because on that final day, there will no longer be any opposition. That's the difference. And it's the same way when it comes to his glory. He is glorious now. He is beautiful and majestic and good now. He is worthy of all praise and honor now. But it is also true that there are those who deny the reality of who he is, and so they refuse to worship him, even though he is worthy of that worship, and even though that worthiness is publicly displayed to them even now. You might be familiar with a passage from Psalm 19. It goes like this. Maybe you can fill in the blanks. The heavens declare the glory. The heavens declare right now on this earth or you know, in our world now, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. The simple truth is that simply by living on this earth, looking at what has been made, we can see the worthiness of God. We can behold the glory of God, His majesty and worthiness. But of course, despite being able to see that truth, the Apostle Paul informs us of what rebellious and sinful men and women do with that truth. They suppress that truth. Despite the fact that God's eternal power and divine nature is clearly seen in what has been made, people do not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. Rather, they exchange the glory of God for idols and false gods, for themselves and other things that are not worthy. Which, just as a side point of clarification, it's quite likely that we have wondered before, how is it that God can hold people accountable on the day of judgment when they never heard the gospel? There's people in, you know, quote-unquote, out-of-the-way places of the world, or at times in, in history, and they never heard the gospel. And yet, we are given to understand that they're going to be judged on that last day. How can that be? They never had the opportunity to hear the gospel and either accept or reject Christ. Well, this is why. Because it was made clear even to them by what has been made. The eternal power and divine nature of God. His glory, His majesty, His worthiness to be served was made clear through nature and yet people still reject Him and they are without excuse. So, God is every bit as glorious today as He will be on that final day. The main difference being that when Christ comes in his glory, it will no longer be deniable. It will no longer be deniable. And yet, like before, with his rule and reign, in the meantime, he endures and is patient with those who currently deny that glory in the meantime because he will not return until the Father's perfect timing when that lost sheep is found. But again, once that happens, and that last day comes, he will return in that glory, and there will be no more denying after that. For every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under under the earth, everywhere, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Daniel prophesied, saying, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days, that would be God the Father, and was presented before him. 
And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. On that final day, Jesus will come into his glorious inheritance as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will take his rightful place on the throne in full dominion, unopposed, that all peoples and nations and languages would serve him. And remember, again, from some weeks back, this is the, this is the glory that we're waiting for. This is the life that we are anticipating to be ruled by the Lord in the fullness of his kingdom. Because that's when all will be made right with the earth. That is when all the tears will be wiped away and all the sorrows forgotten. And so we come into our inheritance because we get to be ruled by him and we get to serve him and he comes into his inheritance because as the king, he's the one who does the ruling and receives the service as is his right. And again, so much of our ability to be joyful about this and to accept it is marred by our own sinful natures. But that's why we have things like creeds and catechisms to remind us of the truths. We think about the Westminster Shorter Catechism, that very first question and answer. The question being, what is the chief end of man? In other words, what is our entire purpose? Why do we even exist? And the answer is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And again, our own sinfulness would much prefer to glorify ourselves and enjoy ourselves forever, as if that would be a good thing. And so sometimes we truly uh, struggle to embrace the idea of enjoying God forever, especially if the way we do that is by serving Him. Because again, we think about our experience on this earth and we do not think of service necessarily as a good thing. Part of that's because of our own sinful nature again. Part of it's because of our experience. We've had teachers, we've had bosses, we've had whatever other kind of taskmaster, a drill sergeant, an officer, a government official over us in authority, and they are sinful. And so their exercise of their authority and our service to them is bounded by their own harshness, their own unreasonable demands. But, and I pray you've had this experience I thank God that I had, I had the opportunity for this experience. Every once in a while, you get a teacher or a boss or an instructor who clearly cares about you, who, who, who praises you when you do right and doesn't overwhelm you, yet helps you to carry the load. And when that's the case, you have to serve. But you actually realize it's a joy to serve that person. I hope you've had that experience. It's the slightest, merest glimpse of the idea that it will be a continual joy to serve God for all time. Setting aside even the fact that God bestows incredible blessings on his servants anyway. Jesus himself on one occasion says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Okay, there's the obligation. But then he says, and where I am, there will my servant be also. All right, that's, that's the reward, that we would serve him and therefore be with him, to be with Christ. And then he says, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. To be honored by God the Father himself. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Is there any greater delight than the thought of God drawing us in and then bringing us into and heaping on us his own joy. What an incredible thought. This is the glory of God. His goodness. All that he is. His worthiness that we should glorify him and enjoy him forever. But before we close, another last quick thought, a comparison. 
Let me ask you this. Prior to the day of judgment, which of course hasn't happened yet, but prior to that day, when, what was the occasion of our Lord's last public appearance? Think about that just for a second here. In his earthly ministry, when he was with us before his ascension, what was the occasion of our Lord's last public appearance? It's his crucifixion. Yes, we do know that he appeared to his people, the women at the tomb, the disciples. Even on one occasion, the Apostle Paul tells us to 500 brothers at the same time. And that's a lot of people. You might consider that to be public, but keep this in mind, those were all his people. He appeared within the confines of his church, you might say. But his last, the last occasion in which he was put on display for all the world to see was on the cross. And on that cross, he experienced none of the glory that was due his name. Rather, he experienced extreme humiliation and shame. He was mocked jeered at. People wagged their heads at him. He was publicly presented to the world as an object, object of derision and disgust and scorn. But what will his next public appearance be like? When he returns, he will not return in that humiliation. He will not return in anything leading to scorn or derision. He will return in all of his glory. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. He will be presented to the whole world in a state of undeniable glory. And our Lord God will be vindicated. He'll be vindicated. The whole world, the whole unbelieving world will be proven wrong that he was and always has been the King of kings and Lord of lords. And no one will be able to deny who he is or his majesty, his beauty, his goodness, or his worthiness. And so my final question for you today is, does that idea excite you and exhilarate you to think about our Lord coming back in His glory, that He would be vindicated. Yes, it is glorious. God is glorious that He lets us share in His glory. So all of the good things that will happen to us certainly look forward to that as well. Our salvation, our eternal lives, absolutely. But does the thought of what happens to Christ, does that get you going? That our Lord will be properly glorified over all the earth. To put it another way, does it grieve you right now in this life? Does it grieve you to hear our Lord's name used as a curse word? Does it grieve you that our King does not currently receive the glory He is due from His creation, but rather the mockery and the slander and the denigration continues? Does it grieve you to hear those accusations come against him and all of the smug, the smugness on display when people feel justified in saying that he is not worthy? Does it grieve you? Well, if it does, and I, I'll be honest, I hope it does. I hope that we do experience grief when our Lord is denigrated. But if it does grieve you, Know these two things. Know, first off, that there, but for the grace of God, go each one of us. Okay? Grieve for those things, but do not lash out. Grieve when you hear the, your Lord's name being dragged through the mud, but do not pounce on that person. Rather, pity them and love them enough to tell them about the glory of Jesus Christ, the beauty of and the worthiness of this one who is willing to pay the ultimate price of his own life to pay 
such that, such that those very same blasphemies could be forgiven. And number two, know that on that final day, our Lord will be vindicated. And the whole earth will be full of His glory. And no one will be able to deny it ever again. And we will enter His kingdom. And we will be with Him, worshiping Him, serving Him, and enjoying Him forever. Amen? I love you all very, very much. That's why I bring you this message. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious and good God, we praise you. We honor your name, for you are worthy. For all that you are, for all that you've done, you are worthy to be praised. Thank you for the truth of your word. Please apply that truth deeply within our hearts today. And it's in your name and for your honor and glory we pray this above all else. Amen.